So this is, um, most of you know, uh, Keith Well. Keith was a uh, uh, Kansas University and just straight out of high school in 2008. That's he got his uh, bachelor's degree in uh, atmospheric, or marine and atmospheric sciences. Yeah, it was, uh, atmospheric and oceanic sciences. Uh, right here, and then went up to the master's degree. nice to be back and see everybody uh, from a long time ago. So I actually, during my PhD work, I changed themes up quite a bit from what I had done for my, both my bachelor's and master's here. And I was focused on building these kind of large scale ocean models like you see behind this. Um, this is an example of a mesh of the ocean. You guys are probably familiar with this kind of approach. And we use this model to, to simulate coastal ocean hydrodynamics. And it's actually a, a, a big challenge to build these meshes. And so that was kind of one main major theme of my thesis. I'm going to go through. The title for my thesis was actually quite a bit longer, but I just kind of truncated it because uh, it doesn't look so nice when you format it. But um, yeah, so let's get started. So the, the, the type of problem or the class of problems we are focused on is concerned with the prediction of total water levels associated with large scale disturbances like hurricanes. Uh, this is an example of Hurricane Sandy, which everyone's very familiar with here. And uh, they cause a great uh, deal of destruction along the shoreline, a lot of flooding, a lot of high, high uh, velocity currents. And we can actually uh, do a number of ways to model it, but one of the kind of most robust ways to model it is by using these kind of large scale ocean models and embedding them in with much finer resolution in the area of interest. So this is an example of that kind of approach here. We have a mesh. This is composed of uh, triangles. And it, it discretizes a coastal ocean domain. And we use this model with some kind of uh, program. There, there's tons out there. And, and they can solve these governing equations. They discretize them on the triangular mesh. And then we can get very accurate water level predictions. Uh, this is an example of total. Uh, typically, we we're measure the peak water levels because that's what causes flooding, is peak water level. And so we want very good agreement with measured data, and, and we can actually achieve that with this approach. The other major focus for this kind of work besides coastal flooding is that uh, if you have any kind of uh, you know, marine navig navigability or you need, you're interested in 
just what the water level is going to be typically offshore, you need to uh, predict the tides. And these are, as you all know, driven by the periodic variations of the sun and the moon. Um, and they can be extremely large in certain areas. For example, here is uh, the Bay of Fundy, which is located right there. Tides can vary by almost 16 meters or 45 feet. Um, so obviously, if you don't get the tides right, um, your ship's going to be on the ground. The other really uh, important aspect of modeling tides is that you need to get the total water level. So the total water level can be partitioned into a surge component and a tide component. And these are not, it's just not a linear superposition between the surge and the tide. They are interacting with one another. And so if you're going to get the total water level correct, you need, for example, this is at Chesapeake Bay uh, Tunnel in Virginia. You can see that if the storm surge hit at high tide, the water level is uh, quite enhanced here. But if you could imagine if it hit during low tide, it would be not as severe. So getting accurate tides is very important. And the tides are periodic, so we can actually break them up into uh, harmonic constituents. And the major ones that we're really focused on are, are, known, are driven by the moon, the lunar species. Uh, they have two high tides and two low tides per day. And then the diurnal species, which is uh, only once per day. And depending on where you are in the world, uh, you, you'll either have a, basically a combination of both, but some areas have more, uh, more focus on the diurnal uh, species. So let's just introduce the equations here. The governing equations are known as shallow water equations. It's very similar in the atmosphere. The uh, vertical scales are much smaller in comparison with the horizontal length scales, so they're called long waves. And, we, uh, and through that assumption, we can uh, well, we can make the assumption that the pressure is hydrostatic, so it's just due to the weight of the water column. And we have two equations. Uh, this one's a vector, u is a vector, so we actually have three equations and three unknowns. And uh, basically, the, the length scales of the problem are uh, related to geostrophy, so we can actually make some assumptions and simplify the, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations and, and, and arrive at these two uh, kind of equations here. The dominant forces are really pressure gradient force and advection. Uh, we have the Coriolis force, and there's some kind of dissipation term. And to force the model, we typically use winds and waves. Uh, so they impart a stress on the top of the water column, which moves the water onshore. And when I'm going to basically, what we get out of these models is the free surface elevation, which is zeta. And that's the perturbation above the mean, levels, uh, mean sea level state there. So that's what we're modeling, is data and the depth average velocity u. So when I first joined the lab at, at Notre Dame, and uh, pretty much anybody who joins an engineering company that builds these kind of models, they're going to use this software called Surface Water Modeling Systems, or SMS. It's a, a licensed version of a program uh, that builds these triangular meshes or can help you build them. And the way it works is uh, you trace the shoreline boundaries from a satellite imagery, or you could, you could also give it your own uh, shoreline boundary, but it won't do anything for you. It just is a boundary. Uh, and then you can specify the resolutions by hand. So you can say, uh, in this zone, we want a certain size element. And then over here, we want it to grow at a certain rate and reach one kilometers. But you can imagine that this is a very tedious pro uh, process. And actually, uh, one of the first projects that I had there was uh, working on this Indian Ocean West Pacific model. So this is a, a finite element model. And it, this is triangular mesh. And these are the sizes of the mesh. So we're looking at resolution here. And the, it took around seven years of work and six different researchers to actually construct this model. And so at this point, we, we you know, were in, in danger of losing funding and all this problems happening because the mesh development process was actually taking so much time and uh, because we specify the resolution zones by hand, things tend to be very numerically unstable, uh, just because you can't readily consider the stability criterion for the model uh, very easily. So what took so long? Well, the first problem is the shoreline is, is very irregular. So it contains features that are subgrid scale. And this is an image of the shoreline along the Gulf of Mexico. So you have all these polders and uh, small scale channel features. And so when, if you just uh, you know, plug this into SMS, uh, it wouldn't really do you much good because you have to simplify the boundary yourself. And this is what takes so long. This is a huge component or a huge amount of effort goes into removing certain scale features from the problem. And the other thing is we don't really understand what an efficient distribution of resolution is. We 
we kind of have idea of uh, what a necessary condition is, but we don't really fully understand what sufficient condition is. So we, as a result, we go kind of conservative. And the way we do that is we can estimate the wave speed, the wave speed of uh, the dominant mode of variability in the ocean as through shallow water wave theory. And then we can say, well, we want a certain number of nodes per wavelength of that dominant mode. And that's called the wavelength heuristic. And so the problem is, though, that the resolution transitions are extremely slow. This is, there's really been no exploration into seeing how, how fast we can ex uh, expand out the resolution in this kind of problem. And as a result of the fact that we're using very fine resolution near shore, uh, there's a mismatch between the resolution in the coastal ocean and the resolution along the shoreline with this heuristic. So what ends up happening is we set alpha wavelength to typically around 100 plus nodes per wavelength. And then that actually leads to uh, some problems because it doesn't match the shelf resolution. And so you, you end up with uh, 100 nodes per wavelength of the tide where you don't, you don't really need that from an analysis point of view. So the, the motivation behind that heuristic is lost in, the, uh, in, the, in practice. And there's no really comprehensive study on this. So uh, that was kind of a big motivating factor for a lot of this work. Can you just comment again? Sure. It says resolution transitions are slow, <coughs> approximately square root of h. Right, proportional to that. What, did, what does that say? Um, well, so because the, uh, this is the edge length, the h, so edge length of triangle. So basically what I'm saying is that because the H controls, the T M2 is not changing. Uh, so we're actually just estimating based on the square root of H. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I have a question. Sure. What is the uh, H about the, the uh, wave speed and ratio or something? How are these two related? Uh, which, what, this is the edge length of the triangle. The, the other edge is the total water level depth. No, the one just no, above it. Just above the, the, the uh, this is estimating, This is we know the wavelength of the M2 uh, because we, we can estimate that from shallow water wave theory. And then we, we decide on some number. This is a user defined parameter. We say we want 5, 10, 100 uh, nodes per wavelength of that. And then this allows us to uh, plug into here. But the wavelength of the M2 is huge. That's correct. That's why we have to divide it so many times. And that's why this is so high, artificially set high. So it's really not appropriate for this, uh, but uh, that's kind of what we typically use to guide resolution application in the coastal ocean for this class of problems. So my question was, are, are these two H's uh, related? Yes, they're, they're equal to each other. Yeah. So uh, actually, what this ends up resulting in is an enormous mesh. Uh, we built this mesh for the Gulf of Mexico with a focus on the western Louisiana, Texas coastline. And uh, we have 9 million elements, or 9 million nodes and 82 million elements here. And uh, it has an incredible accuracy. But because of the application of resolution is effectively uniform or very, very slowly varying, can be considered uniform. The, uh, the model is extremely difficult to run. And we're using a wavelength grid scale heuristic here. And because we've used a program like SMS to create it, the approach is not reproducible. We don't have, uh, if you gave somebody this, uh, the input files would be very difficult to recreate this exact model without extreme care uh, in the mesh development process. So it's very, very difficult to reproduce this result. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, is the resolution really necessary for this approach? Because we have such a large mesh, we need to ask ourselves, is it justified or not, and how we can reduce that cost. Can I just ask another question? In yes. This, in this uh, area that you're talking about, the Gulf here, yep. can you comment on what shoreline uh, files you're using and what bathymetry files you're using? So for this mesh, uh, <coughs> I believe we use uh, what's known as the NOAA US medium shoreline. So this is a, basically a shape file that NOAA's put out in around 2011, I think they released it. I'm not exactly sure. But the data sets, it's a kind of a hodgepodge of a bunch of different ones all put together and rectified to the same vertical datum. Mm -hmm. So that was an enormous amount of work in terms of data collection. Mm -hmm. But there's no one source. I mean, there's a whole variety of them. Yeah. So the, the goal of this part of the, the talk is very straightforward. We want to reduce the cost and the time 
spent building these modeling systems, these finite element unstructured meshes of the coastal ocean. We want to improve the scientific reproducibility of the process uh, through some kind of standardization. And we want to quantify how, how much the discretization actually has an effect on the shallower flows and, and kind of where is the error originating from. So the rest of the talk is going to be the first two parts are going to be focused on mesh generation and applying it to a realistic problem. And then I'm going to talk, switch gears a little bit and talk about the other aspect of my work, which is known as dynamic load balancing to re uh, reduce the cost of simulations of coastal flooding. So uh, for I, I spent a, a long time uh, working with this program called SMS. And then I kind of got frustrated and, and started to uh, develop my own program to do this uh, process. And uh, we ended up with the help of one postdoc in the lab, uh, him and I developed Ocean Mesh 2D, which is basically an object-oriented approach to designing, building, and actually eventually uh, you know, running meshes uh, that can be used for high-fidelity coastal ocean simulation. And it's broken up into four stages. Uh, it's an object-oriented approach, so there's classes, and each class has associated methods and it's kind of a more modern programming type of approach, if you're familiar with that. Uh, essentially, any, if you're going to build a mesh, you need to have geospatial data. You can't do it without it. So in this approach here, we're actually feeding the, this class constructor with a bunch of shape files, DEMs, digital elevation models, uh, the available data sets that we have. And then we use that to actually construct mesh size functions through mathematical relationships between the, the data and the uh, physics of the coastal ocean. After we've done that for the domain we, we call the mesh generator, uh, which we wrote custom for this problem, and then we have a, a basically a post-processing visualization unit to kind of analyze and inspect data sets and apply boundary conditions. So this allows us to actually script the whole mesh generation process in about 30 to 50 lines. I can give somebody the script, and then they can build the mesh uh, from that script. And we have a website where the software is. We have a paper on the software in geoscientific model development and a, a user guide which goes over how to use it. And the hope is that other people start using it and, and really start contributing because it's a community-based effort and not just me and William, which uh, is how it is now. So basically, uh, in this approach here, we don't uh, uh, force the user to simplify the shoreline boundary ahead of time. So in this approach here, we represent the shoreline through sine distance functions. And a sine distance function is essentially a way to determine what's in and outside of a meshing domain. So for example, if we have this bounding box here, which is our meshing domain, and we have a shoreline, which is a polygon. So what I mean is that its first point equals the last. We can compute the intersection of two areas. And that's what this hatched blue region is here. And if it's inside the hatch region, it has a negative 1 for the sine function. Otherwise, it's positive. This allows us to define the boundary of the meshing domain as the points in the, in the space that have a sine distance equal to 0. And all the points that are less than or equal to 0 are inside the meshing domain. So the result is that we can actually pass the mesh generator all the full complexity of the original shoreline data set. And uh, we, we use this kind of calculation to automatically do a number of things. We can classify segments as being either islands or components of the mainland or certain kinds of internal type barriers or whatnot. So once we have a geospatial data set embedded into the software, we, we have a number of uh, units to build mesh size functions here. And we have these are mesh size functions is a, is a uh, basically takes a coordinate in the space and it returns to you a desired or an ideal mesh size, which is the edge length of the triangle. So the user has a number of options. We can, for example, just simply change the minimum size near shore. We can vary the resolution according to the width of the feature. Uh, we can place resolution according to Thalwag databases. Thalwag? Uh, so a Thalwag is the, the deepest component of an estuary. It's the, it's the component where uh, flow is actually conveyed because the water tries to go in the path of least resistance. And in a lot of these estuaries, you, sometimes you have an ancestor river or a fluvial component that's been drowned, or you have a, a marine channel that's been dredged. And so these are very important to resolve correctly because they have, very, for example, on their banks, they have large gradients. And if you don't capture gradients in a, in a model correctly, 
leads to error. So the other, the other, and that's exactly the motivation behind the slope heuristic. So we can actually place resolution along the continental shelf break according to this uh, simple thing called the topographic length scale. Um, and so we calculate these, these mesh size functions on a background grid. So I really want to stress this because it's a little confusing. The background grid is structured. So we have a, a background grid that we calculate ahead of time before we start the mesh generation process. And we can query that, that function during runtime, and it will return back a size for us. The reason why it's structured is that it's a lot easier to deal with structured grids when you're programming. And also the other aspect is that DEMS, the, the data sets that we're given are actually structured. So it makes sense to use that approach. After we've computed all the mesh sizes, we can actually take the minimum of all the combinations and then enforce a, a, size, a size smoothness constraint, G, so that the element sizes don't grow too large. So one of the things that I spent a long time on, and it's extremely important for coastal modeling, is to get really accurate resolution distributions along the shoreline. So the way I do that is I estimate the shoreline width according to uh, what's known as the feature size. And basically, the, these grids, this is a stencil, or basically a, a component of the DEM. These are the, the points in the DEM. And we've identified certain points in the DEM that we consider to be something known as medial points. And medial points are equidistant from the, the shoreline boundary uh, on both sides. And so once we know that, we can actually use it to estimate the, the width of the channel. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically it allows us, instead of uh, arbitrarily placing uniform shoreline resolution near shore, we can use this feature size function and uh, produce the same and capture the same amount of connectivity, but relax the resolution where we don't have a lot of uh, where the feature is wider, and it will smoothly vary because we're enforcing a, a, grid, a grading constant on, on the mesh size function here. So this is a, just, you can basically use it inside the technology. You just turn it on, and it can produce meshes that look something like that. The other real uh, focus of the software is we have a, a channel tool, I guess you could call it. It's a way to identify uh, thaw wags in estuaries. So for example, this is uh, Galveston Bay at Houston's over there. Uh, so you, in this estuary, you have a very well-defined marine navigation channel here. And so for automatic mesh generation, you, you would want to probably place high resolution on here if you're interested in circulation inside the estuary. And we can actually distribute resolution around that thaw wag uh, using this approach here. This is a, something that I came up with. It basically represents the cross-sectional profile of the channel as upside down cones. And the cones form on the top of the, you know, because we have a 2D model here. This is the planar view. We can uh, have a basically a region of influence around each one of the thawwag points where we can actually ma change the resolution uh, according to the angle of reslope here, theta, and also this alpha channel parameter. So it allows the user to control the resolution distribution along the thawwag. And uh, this allows us to get more accurate seabed when uh, seaboard, seabed profiles when we interpolate data onto the mesh. The other uh, really key component of the software is that we can enforce size gradation bounds. So uh, we solve this equation here, and this allows us to bound the mesh size. Mesh size is h, or edge length. So we can uh, vary the mesh size gradation from very fast to very slow. And we can even vary it according to depth. So for example, in this case, where it's shallow, we may want to use a much slower gradation rate. And then offshore, we want to enhance the gradation rate or enlarge it so that we can save vertices away from the region of influence. So this is a, a feature that's embedded in the software. For the mesh generation, we use uh, we modified a, basically an algorithm that was published in this paper here. And it's based on the concept of force equilibrium. So this is your a pretend domain or a cartoon domain. And you distribute an initial set of points according to some density function, which comes from your mesh size function. And you can trivially triangulate that. You get something that looks kind of very bad for finite elements. And then you can uh, apply this concept of force equilibrium, where you model the bars of the triangulation as springs. And when you apply external force to that, the points iteratively move around. And given enough time and uh, the proper uh, mesh improvement strategies, you can achieve something that looks like this. So effectively, we can, we can start from a trivial distribution of points here and then achieve a very accurate 
um, a very nice mesh for the coastal ocean, and that agrees well with the mesh size function that the user built. However, because we didn't simplify the boundary ahead of time, since we're giving the shoreline data set to the mesh generator, there's a lot of problems that happen along the shoreline boundary that we have to deal with and uh, that would otherwise uh, ruin the automatic nature of the mesh generator. So uh, effectively what I'm trying to show here is that the mesh generator, you can actually choose how many features you want to incorporate uh, through a cleaning algorithm. So you can go from very, very detailed to very, very simple uh, through changing some parameters in the, in the mesh size, uh, in the algorithm. So basically, you can read about that in the paper. And what this has led us to do is basically uh, produce domain decompositions of the meshing domain so we can have localized regions of very fine resolution <coughs> in areas of interest where we have great data. So for example, here is an example of a LiDAR data set. And we, this is where the data is about one meter in horizontal resolution. And we want to only have high resolution in this area. And elsewhere, we want to kind of expand it out and simplify the, me the mesh. So this allows us to, uh, you know, we can write a script and then basically ingest all this data on a, on a typical laptop. You don't need any kind of supercomputer to do this. And it will produce a, you know, a very nice message, the Great South Bay. And then here, we're including the overland components of the mesh. And uh, it does a sophisticated algorithm to uh, lock the edges of the shoreline so that when you go to interpolate the seabed, the land-sea interface isn't washed out, which would otherwise occur if you, if you kind of just kind of naively uh, put the seabed topography on the mesh. So what we're doing now is we've constructed uh, meshes around the entire world, actually 2,000 meshes. Each one of these tiles is the SRTM, which is a global topobathy data set, which was just released. Uh, well, they've, they've been kind of updating it continually since 2001. And basically, we can build these locally high-resolution tiles. So each one of these tiles has locally 50-meter resolution in, in element size. And when a hurricane is approaching the shoreline, we can actually activate a certain set of tiles in a, in a scripting approach and then embed them into a global mesh that we have running all the time. And then we can get very high resolution forecasts near shore automatically. So for example, we, we did this with a couple of storms in Madagascar. And we're posting the results actually online so everyone can see them. And uh, the forecast system is almost fully automatic at this point. So this is uh, something that's ongoing that I hope to work on a little bit more in the future. So there's no human supervision there. So the major outcome of this mesh generator is that we can build these uh, meshes uh, the software is free. If you have MATLAB, besides the cost of the MATLAB, it doesn't require any toolboxes in MATLAB. Uh, we tried to use native functions. We're working on uh, getting it to work with Octave, which is a uh, clone of, of MATLAB. And the main result is that we construct these models automatically and approximately re reproducibly. Uh, if I give somebody that same script and the same data sets, they can build the mesh in, in minutes to hours. And uh, we're, we're actively looking for more collaboration with people. We have a couple projects uh, with, with NOAA uh, on, on using this technology to update some of their grids that they run in real time. So once we were able to build the mesh so easily, uh, we, we began to ask new questions. How does the solution depend on the mesh? And it's been historically very difficult to answer this kind of question with, uh, with this class of problem because it's so difficult to actually construct one mesh how do you even ask yourself how to depend on it? Uh, so it was kind of ignored for a long time. And the idea here is that there's two components of error. Actually, there's a third component, but I'm neglecting that. The first component is the representation error, the shoreline. We have to simplify the, the domain. So we're going to truncate some aspects of the shoreline. And that leads to an error. And then the other error is related to the numerics. Because we're discretizing on a grid, uh, there's going to be a truncation error because uh, the equations are continuous. And both these things conflate together to form what's known as a total error. The third component of the error is actually the assumptions that we're making in representing the physics. So we have a lateral eddy viscosity model. We have a certain assumption of what uh, the structure, the vertical structure is of the uh, ocean. Uh, we're neglecting bare clinic stuff. So I'm ignoring that for this component of the work. So in order to, ask the, to kind of answer this question, we uh, chose a realistic domain that we use a lot in this kind of problem. It's the East Coast and Gulf Coast. I abbreviated ECGC. 
And we built a reference solution. So this is an extremely conservatively resolved mesh, around 11 million vertices. It's extremely difficult to build a mesh of this size for anyone who's tried to do that. Um, and we ran, ran the tides. And the reason why we're focused on the tides and not a storm surge event is because the tides are periodic. So they're not these ephemeral events that happen, and they can be very case event specific. We wanted something that we could draw some conclusions based on the nature of shallow water physics rather than a particular event where it's a little bit difficult to discern. So we, we basically start from a reference solution, and then we perturb that reference solution, trying to relax the parameters and a, achieve a, uh, a lighter weight solution. And so what I'm showing here is the domain and also the reference solution resolution. So we use uniform or, or max element size bounds that were extremely conservative. In the red zone, it's 250. In the green, it's one kilometer. In the blue, it's five kilometers. So it's extremely overly resolved in terms of uh, building, a, building a mesh for the tides. And to kind of analyze the differences in solution, we're, we're computing the, rep, the relative error. So we're, we're looking at the amplitude from one solution and then differencing it by projecting the reference solution onto the coarser mesh and then computing this error term. And you know, as I showed before, the governing equations, we cannot actually solve them in their primitive form. Uh, there's a, a common problem that happens when you do this. It's been around since the 70s. You have a two delta x wave that comes about when you try to discretize the continuity equation on the mesh. So you have to use it, uh, do it using something known as generalized wave continuity equation. This is one approach to solving the problem. You uh, take your primitive continuity equation, you, multi you take the time derivative of that equation, and you add it to itself. And then you end up with a wave equation. And you have this weighting parameter, which controls, uh, it's a continuum between a pure wave equation. And it, it, in the case that this goes to infinity, then it becomes a pure primitive continuity equation. So I'm not going to go through too many details here. But basically, the, this is pretty typical uh, for this problem. We, we solve the vertically integrated momentum equations with the dominant forces. I want to stress that we have the full set of equations on. Some people turn off terms to get stability. Uh, we're using the full shallow water equations in their nonlinear form. So the nonlinear advective terms are enabled. Uh, and we're using a constant lateral eddy stress. So we're not using some kind of grid scale dependent lateral eddy viscosity model, which could be problematic for a grid convergence study. So kind of what this looks like, one of the first things we, we started doing was expanding out the mesh size gradation. So this is changing the element size rate. So uh, this, is, this can save us an enormous amount of vertices if we perturb this parameter. Um, and what ends up happening is once you do this kind of naively, uh, the solution diverges substantially. So this basically colorful region in the Gulf of Maine is indicating that there's almost up to a 20% error in the harmonic constituents for the M2. But when we decrease the gradation rate, we see our error is kind of uh, focused on the Georgia's bank region. But it has much more vertices, about 4.9. So actually, we can analyze the convergence properties of these meshes by plotting them on something known as cumulative area fraction error curve. What you just need to know here is that if the curves diverge more from the y-axis, there's more error in the computational domain. And so what we want is the solution to converge to the reference. So we should see something where the courses mesh, actually the error keeps decreasing and eventually hits the y-axis once we go to infinitely fine resolution. So what we find is that the gradation rate saves us an enormous amount of vertices, but actually uh, causes a huge error in the solution. And then the other kind of uh, heuristic that we analyzed was the slope mesh size heuristic. So this is changing the number of nodes per gradient of the bathymetry. And so when we started to incorporate slope resolution inside our mesh, uh, we instantly found that it produced convergent solutions to the reference. Um, it converged to the reference solution very rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. So this 20 means that we're changing this x parameter here. So the higher the number here, the more resolution per slope. Uh, that's kind of take on point there. And then we wanted to find ways to more efficiently discretize the inner shelf region. So we could just use the slope heuristic because there's gradients in the near shore region, but it tends to be very costly to do that because it's the, the seabed topography is fairly noisy. So we can actually extract the Thalwag network uh, using the software and then place resolution along that Thalwag network automatically according to that channel mesh size function that I talked about earlier. And this allows us to more efficiently discretize the domain. So this is an example of the 
the seabed profile along the transect here. So we see we have a, a much more accurate seabed profile when we consider resolution along the channels, obviously. And actually, as it turns out, when you have uh, enhanced resolution along the stall lag networks, you actually improve the tidal constituents, particularly in convergent estuaries like uh, the Chesapeake. Um, and you also have divergent estuaries too. But basically, in, in these kind of estuaries like the Delaware and the Chesapeake, you have these very well-defined pronounced stall lags. And it actually does influence the circulation significantly. So if you just were to build a mesh with a high gradation rate to save you time, but you didn't place enough resolution along the thaw lag, the solution would be substantially underpredicted in that uh, estuary. So it just kind of stresses the point that you need to be very careful with how you discretize the meshing domain if you're interested in high resolution forecasts or simulations. So the, the kind of uh, basic capstone point of this was that we were uh, using it to uh, basically take combinations of mesh size functions. So here we would actually uh, take 50 meters near shore and use the slope mesh size heuristic, but expand out the gradation rate to save vertices. And uh, what we found is that when we take combinations of these mesh size functions, we can achieve a converged solution. So one that actually starts to uh, approach the reference solution and has far fewer vertices. So combo three here, which incorporates a number of the mesh size functions I was discussing, actually has a plus or minus 3% error in the M2 constituent in 99% of the domain. Uh, in comparison, if you just went very fine and you used slope heuristic, which is our best performing experiment, that would be 5.9 million vertices. So there's a big, uh, there's a lot of thinking that has to go in when you're designing this mesh. And I think that this kind of work helps you uh, navigate that space a little bit better. Yep. Mm -hmm. Directly proportional to the number of vertices, or does it, is there some sort of. Uh, it is, yeah. So it's, it's directly proportional. And all these meshes are bounded by 0.5 current number. So they all run at the same stable time step. Uh, so there's no differences in, in that numerical aspect of the problem. So, yeah, this mesh is going to run 10 times faster than the reference solution because the reference solution is about 11.3 million nodes. So to kind of summarize this aspect of the work here, we computed some basic error metrics. And what basic point here is that if the scatter falls on the one-to-one -one line, we have a, a much more accurate solution. And so if we don't consider any of the mesh size functions that I just discussed, and we just try to expand out the grade to save us uh, computational resources, we see that the solution has a, has a much larger scatter. The normalized uh, root mean square error uh, is, is larger, and we have very few vertices, actually 1.4 million nodes. But when we just kind of more intelligently discretize the domain using the mesh size functions, we can get a converged solution that has far fewer error. In fact, the bias reduced by a factor of four, we reduce the variance by six, and we have even less vertices than the other mesh. So what this looks like is this is the mesh that's currently used by NOAA. Uh, it's in operations, it's called HSOFs. And it has 780,000 degrees of freedom underwater, but because of the application, the manual application of resolution, uh, it, it can only uh, support 250 meters for operational runtime constraints. So this approach here, we've built the final mesh for my dissertation work is, is called, I call it Combo 3. Kind of a strange name, but anyway, the thing is it's 1.3 million degrees of freedom underwater, and it uses five times finer resolution because we're kind of if it more efficiently discretizing the, the meshing domain here. So basically, the take home point is that we could reproduce the reference solution within a plus or minus 3% error tolerance uh, for the M2 and the K1 elevation amplitudes. And that's about you know nine times less vertices or, or eight times less vertices than the reference solution using these uh, ocean mesh software and actually using mesh size functions uh, very carefully for this kind of problem. And uh, we have a preprint we submitted to Ocean Modeling. It's in review right now. So if you want to read more, you can find that there. So now just switching gears here, um, the last component of the talk is related to something called dynamic load balancing to speeding up these simulations of coastal flooding. And this is a, a little bit departure from meshing. But basically, when we build this uh, computational mesh of this domain, 
it, it typically has so many nodes that we can't help to simulate with serially. So we have to parallelize the calculation. And the way we do that is you break up the domains into small chunks here that have equal amount of computational work. And they're owned by one processor. They communicate with each other on these overlap nodes called ghost zones here. These are these uh, kind of empty regions here. And basically, the, the point of this is that when we build meshes for coastal flooding, we have to incorporate some of the aspects of the domain overland. And that portion of the mesh is going to have a free surface solution of zero, because there's no free surface uh, head on there. So in AdCIRC and many other kind of these models, and many other models like this, we model the movement of the wetting and drying process as a, uh, a moving boundary, a moving free surface boundary. And it's a logic-based operation, but once the node and the element's wet, actually it has a, you know, it, it solves the, the full shallow water equations on that node. And so effectively what this leads is to very inefficient calculations. We want to have high resolution over land because we want to uh, have very accurate models. But at the same time, we have an enormous amount of dry vertices. And the current treatment of dry and wet vertices is cost the same, actually, inside the solver when it's preparing the calculation. And we want to remove that cost from the calculation. But this is obviously time bearing because the flooding is time bearing. So the ideal case is that we, the dry degrees of freedom would cost nothing, and they only be included when the storm is actually flooding the land. But like I said, this leads to a dynamic load balancing problem, and this is something that I developed software to solve inside AdSERC. So the approach can be summarized in one word. We trade a computational balance for memory imbalance. So in a typical configuration, say we have 24 processors, each processor has an equal number of work if we're doing it right. Um, and the, each one of these bars is partitioned into both dry and wet vertices here. So you can see a lot of processors own almost all dry vertices, and that means that they're just computing a bunch of zeros all at once. So our, the approach that we can take is actually we weight the dry component of the mesh uh, when we break up the subdomains, when we form these subdomains as zero. And this allows us to expand out the dry subdomains dramatically and reduce the size of the wet subdomains this reduces the load, actually. So if we're looking at load as the number of wet vertices, we reduce it dramatically. This logarithmic plot. But at the same time, we put all our dry vertices almost on one processor. So we've traded a computational balance for memory imbalance there. And so the approach now is, what do we do with this data here? We have, a bunch of, we have one processor that owns a, a ton of data, and it's all zero. So the simplest approach is that we arrange data and memory based on computational costs. So if we think about an uh, idealized patch, this is called a star. You have three elements that are wet, three elements that are dry. Uh, we can reorganize the data and memory so the wet elements appear first, followed by the dry. And then likewise, we do the same thing for vertices. And then we, we can actually change the loop extents so that we preserve the contiguity of the data, but we just truncate the loop. So we save 50% savings there, and we save 20% uh, savings there. So, uh, so basically, we, we remove those vertices from the problem. But this uh, basically forms a, a boundary surrounding the offline component of the domain. So if I just plot this, basically, all this stuff is dry. If we do it right, we want to turn all this data offline here. And so we have a boundary between what's on and off. It's known as, in my terminology, checkpoint vertices here. And so as the flooding event occurs, it wets the checkpoint vertice, and it causes the flood to move the boundary back further and further. And so as the flooding event is occurring, we're getting more wet state vertices because the flooding is happening. And so we have to rebalance periodically to maintain a load balanced state. And so that's all I'm showing right here. But in order to do this, is not an easy problem um, because we're writing code in parallel and it has to be fast. So uh, basically, I, I integrated a number of third party libraries to do this problem. Um, in, in finite element simulation, when you're producing a, a parallel program, you need to communicate with only your neighbors. Otherwise, it's not going to be a scalable solution. And uh, in order to do that, I used a number of tools that were available, and I, I kind of modified them for the problem. We also have to set up these ghost zones. So it's actually very difficult to do that, because we just call uh, a graph decomposition library, and it tells us where things are. But we have no control over what it tells us. Uh, we just hope for the best. And so w whatever it gives us, we have to deal with it. And it has to, so then you need very robust and, 
and efficient algorithms to do this problem. So what this looks like in time is uh, we, this is water and this is dry. And as the flooding is occurring, this is offline. We see that as the flood touches the offline component of the mesh, it pushes it back. This changes the, the load balance of the problem. And so if we just repeat that here, uh, we see that we have a number of vertices that are offline. Uh, it's classified by this new yellow category here. So we've, we've turned a lot of vertices offline. We have almost all wet, so we have a really good load balance. We have very few dry vertices, but we see we have to, we have to decide what's off and what's on and when to rebalance. And as it turns out, this calculation is 49% faster than the static case because we have around 50% overland. So we've almost completely removed the cost of the overland vertices. So we need to decide how we determine what's on and off. And the simplest way we can do that is by just looking at the distance. So we say, well, this is wet and this is dry. So we use the nearest distance to determine what's on and offline. However, this, this really affects the rebalance time because if we choose this poorly, we're going to have an enormous amount of rebalance events. And that's going to could actually slow down the calculation time because now we have this new T rebalancing time, the time that we have to set up everything over again once there's a wetting event occurring. So this is just showing that we can have an order of magnitude difference in the wall clock time depending on how we choose the buffer width. That's the separation zone between what's on and offline. And so here we're basically going from you know, half a minute to over a minute for rebalancing operations just by changing that buffer width. And so what ends up happening is you, you end up reaching the scaling limit faster because you've reduced the problem size. So if you go to use the same amount of resources, uh, then you're going to actually have a, uh, a reduced problem because you, you've chopped off around uh, you know, 30 to 50% of your mesh. So it's not really the same problem size. So you're going to hit the scaling limit faster. So that's why the speed ups are kind of tanking once we go to around 1,000 to below, sub 1,000 vertices per processor. So effectively, the approach works really well for, uh, for high processor, high vertices to core configurations. And what this looks like here is I spent a lot of time on basically uh, improving the rebalance criteria and making it more robust. So this is of Galveston Bay. And this is Hurricane Ike making landfall here. And what we find is that we can actually determine the rebalance criteria based on depth instead of distance. And it makes actually more sense to do that because flooding is topographically driven. So if you have a low-lying area, you probably don't want to turn it offline. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what this is showing here. But because the flooding, uh, because there's one value for the entire meshing domain, we have to push back the other areas, even though there's no primary flood going on there. Uh, so that's why the flood happens here. But over here, there's no flooding. But we still push back the offline component of the mesh. So it's a little bit inefficient. but it's uh, much more robust than the distance-based approach. So in order to demonstrate that this stuff works, I, I did an operational forecast configuration of Hurricane Irene on a mesh that's used in operations. So I basically took their simulation configuration and I ran my code with it. And kind of what that looks like is on the top is what you would get with traditional AdCERC. And on the bottom is what you get with dynamic AdCERC, which is what I wrote, AdCERC plus DLB. And the, the calculation is, uh, is, pretty, is the same. So actually, if you look at the peak wear levels, the difference is at the machine precision level. And I spent a great deal of effort trying to make sure that was correct. It's very important. Uh, but effectively, the problem rebalances in time. And we did some scaling analysis on it. And we found that, well, we're doing pretty well with the rebalancing time. It's occupying 2% of the total. The code is scaling very well. These are changing the buffer. So I'm, I'm diff using different buffer configurations here. But what we found is we only were getting maximally 20% speed up. And we know that for this particular problem that the speed up should be closer to 50%. And so it came, we, we asked ourselves kind of why. And what we looked at is when we plotted the workload distribution, we found that there were a couple processors that had quite a bit of wet state vertices. So the load balancing wasn't very good for this particular mesh. So when we looked at that, actually, in, in the top-down view, we found that there was a couple <coughs> subdomains that have resolution or mesh size that looks something like this. And if you know, this isn't the greatest mesh. So actually, what it turns out is the large load anomaly created by this area of the mesh is related to the mesh valency. 
So if you have these singly connected channels actually with two elements and four vertices, it leads to large load imbalances because we're, we're actually balancing the elements of the mesh, not the vertices of the mesh. So we can only choose to do one. So if we balance the elements and there's a large difference in number of vertices, then it will actually lead to a load imbalance. Whereas the ideal case is when you have this patch of six and six, uh, six elements and like say seven, seven vertices, then we can balance both at the same time. So effectively when we remove those when we removed these kind of singly connected elements, uh, we were able to achieve 44% uh, speed up. So the speed ups actually improved with the technology that uh, I, I developed. And so that's kind of the main take home point here is that we need to consider the mesh design when we're using technology like this. Uh, we can't just indiscriminately build meshes and hope for the best. Uh, it affects the, both the performance and the accuracy of the solution as I just demonstrated. And uh, these types of elements, kind of to toot my own horn here, can be dealt with automatically in the software. And so the major outcome is that we have a, a branch of the code that can turn off the overland components of the mesh so you can kind of go crazy with resolving overland and not have to worry too much about it from a computational point of view. And in the future, meshes will likely contain more than 50% vertices overland. Uh, it's not going to be the case that we have less, especially with the, the rate at which sea level is rising and ice ice sheets are all melting, so we're, we're going to uh, have more flooding. So we're going to want to build meshes with more overland components. And so the major conclusions here is that I developed uh, this software for uh, automatic and uh, reproducible mesh generation in the coastal ocean, and it's, you, you can find it online. I presented a more efficient mesh design for tidal modeling using these unstructured meshes. I, have an in-depth analysis on how the mesh design affects the solution and practical development guidelines that can be perhaps helpful for other people. And I developed this AdCirc plus DLB code, which you can download online if you're a member of the AdCirc group. And uh, this can result in speed ups depending on how many mesh uh, elements you have overland. Obviously, if you don't have anything overland, it's not going to do anything for you. Uh, so I developed this software. And then a number of papers fell out of this work that you can read online. And that's it. So thanks for listening. Do you have any questions? Hey, Bob. Yeah. So does this um, avoid all the grid quality problems that you experience with SMS when you first start to make a grid? Sure. All, uh, the, all the wagon wheel problems, the angle. You mean the valency problem? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So actually, this, this uh, I'll just go here. Yeah. So we have a, a number of strategies to, we wrote our own valency reducer. So this will reduce the, so say you have a patch of high valency that looks something like this. You can actually turn it, you can bound the connectivity so that there's never any high valencies in the mesh. The number of connected vertices okay. to, a vertice, to, to, to a particular vertex. Um, there's, a, there's a number of, there's also, like I said in the last part of the talk, the singly connected elements are problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, I don't know, it's very difficult to model a flow through a one element channel because, well, it's a linear element and, you know, both sides, or it's just going to be a, basically a rectangle, I guess. Uh, so it's not going to be very accurate. And secondly, it's problematic from the performance standpoint when you do parallel computing. So we have a, a way to remove those. Actually, in the software, there's a basically a clean operation. And you can say it's a categorical thing. You can say aggressive, passive, default. And then you can change the values if you're more advanced. But it will treat the kind of traditional problems you've dealt with in SMS for a long time automatically. So. Or, um, oh, sorry. No, in the decades ahead, mm -hmm. flooding <coughs> find out it's going to become more and more of a problem to, to deal with. Correct. And so it's going to need the topography very accurate, and LIDAR is quite the way of doing that. So yep. in the work you've done so far, I mean, what do you think with topography? Is it like USGS 10 by 10 meters? No, actually, it's much finer than that. Um, so if we just go back to the, in the beginning here, I showed an image of the 
But this, so these boxes here, each one of the boxes is one ninth arc second. So I think it's one meter to three meter res horizontal resolution. Uh, and these data sets are all popping up around the entire East Coast. Actually, they recently re released something known as the QDEM or CUDEM, and that's actually for, from Maine to Tampa. There's one ninth arc second seamless topobathy data that you can just go online and download. And so the idea is that you can actually throw all that data at this program and, and build mesh size functions and then meshes from it and then go directly to simulation. And that's actually what I did the other day with the uh, SPSS storm search model. So, so this is like a check out the structure or? So I don't do that. Uh, oh, you don't do it, but yeah. is that, does it yes. come with all the building codes? They, they have a team of people, they, they do, that's their job to do that. And there's also automatic algorithms for that uh, too. So it's taken out as a matter of course. Yeah, it's a bare earth them. So yeah, well, I think it's easy for Manhattan. It's not so easy if you have like a shack or, for example, on Fire Island or West Meadow Beach, that stuff pops up and it's very hard to automatically deal with in a, in a data processing algorithm. So, but yeah, this data set, you can, I can, if anyone has, it needs data, I, this East Coast, Gulf Coast, we have terabytes of data for this area, all pre-processed in the same exact format, the same vertical datum, and uh, I'll share it with anybody who wants, so. So given all this stuff, I mean, what, what will be the limiting uh, conditions for accurate storm surge prediction? Of course, you know, everybody in emergency management and urban planning want to know almost street by street. Yeah. And as we know, our geophysicists understand Well, these hydrodynamic models, given the correct inputs, are extremely accurate. I think because you know density is a thousand times greater than the atmosphere, so it tends to be for this coastal barotropic problem, it's, it's a bit simpler to to get the answer right than the atmosphere. Um, if you, you know, if you do general circulation of the ocean, it's much more difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, anecdotal stories about when Sandy was shooting up the Hudson River and mm -hmm. water sloshing this side and that side, and you had to, to believe there could be very rapid, short-scale changes in the wind field. That the well, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, the first slide here I showed was a forecast of Sandy, and we got an incredibly accurate solution. Uh, so, you know, I think the problem is, is pretty well understood. Uh, for the atmosphere, it's much harder. So the uncertainty is going to probably originate from the atmosphere and, you know, propagates into the other model. So, yeah. Yep. Excuse me. What, yep. what bathymetry files did you say you're willing to share? The whole, so I have thousands. <laughs> it's not just one. It's, it's a whole East Coast and Gulf Coast. So we have a, a server where we have all the data that I can just give you. It's NetCDF and okay. geographic. So, so yep. uh, could you please uh, comment on how would uh, the method you developed here can benefit uh, wave modeling? Oh, that's a good question. So the wave model, we have uh, some people that are using this to uh, basically build unstructured meshes for WaveWatch 3. Uh, however, there's, you know, the it's the same kind of problem where you need to have high resolution in the area of interest and then uh, scale back. So the, the work that's kind of being done right now is they're developed, they're trying to explore mesh size functions for wave modeling, but it's, uh, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, for example, if you're using SWAN and coupling to AdCERT, uh, the nature of wave modeling tends to have finer and more restrictive length scales than, than storm surge problems. So you end up kind of resolving for the tide problem much, much too fine, but for the wave problem is, is sufficient. So you end up with this uh, kind of more fundamentally, more fundamental question is like, should I couple my wave model and answer model the way that I'm doing it, or should I have them as separate meshes? You know, is that really the best solution? So I think that uh, there's other approaches out there like ST-Wave, they have separate domains that 
maybe would be more appropriate for this kind of thing. But yeah, like I said, you, you're governed by the, the smallest length scale in the problem. So if waves are, if you're, for example, doing uh, boost and S class modeling, you need sub or one meter resolution. And it makes no sense to couple with a, a storm surge model when the same grid. So does that answer kind of? Right, so yeah. um, um, in your, from your answer, I, I think mm -hmm. my answer standing is that uh, there is uh, now uh, the, the, the mesh function is under developing. Well, well in your, yeah. uh, the, the, the mesh produced by your algorithm, well, uh, we should try it. Just try it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's kind of, yeah. and then. See if it's insufficient, or how you can change the options to support your class of problems. But yeah. But as well as uh, wave breaking becomes very important, and so you need very small uh, cross isobaric resolution in the wave breaking. Right. Well. So that changes. That's what you were saying. Well, I guess I mean that's kind of an extension of the slope mesh size function, where you, you're enhancing resolution along gradients. So perhaps you would filter the bathymetry differently for building a mesh size function for a wave model than if you were doing it for just pure shallow water physics. So um, we, we can have enough freedom in your mesh size function. Yes. To, to you can implement your own mesh size functions. The, the whole approach, the whole workflow is, that's why it's class based. So you can implement your own stuff in each class. So. Yeah, the hope is that more people use it. It's been it's been difficult because the community is really controlled by SMS largely. So, okay, thanks, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.